Hey everybody, welcome back. So today we are gonna be actually talking about what these numbers mean that we've been collecting on these oil testing videos that we've been doing. So I have David here so that we can actually go through and talk individually about each oil and what the numbers mean to each other. We'll also be discussing what these numbers mean to our newfound control that we have here. David, uh, if you want to refresh everybody on your degree. So I have a degree in mechanical engineering with an emphasis in automotive technologies. And my current job is doing high-end research tests for explosive materials. So we do stuff that nobody's ever done before and we blow it up. So David knows what he's talking about and we're gonna look over these numbers because I'm, I'm actually curious to see what some of this stuff means uh, from somebody who uh, truly knows what they're talking about instead of just taking other people's words. We're going to first talk about what the viscosities and what their correlations have to our engine test failure numbers. And we'll just kind of go from viscosity and talk about how, how that affects the end results, the surface tension, how that could affect the end results, and the gear transfer and the oil retention what that would mean to the end results, and then we will go over our control and how important it is to actually have that new number. Just to refresh everybody, viscosity is how a fluid flows, um, its thickness and its properties while flowing. So if we look here at the uh, viscosity of room temperature, and you've got water, 1.3, and this is, this is a time in seconds. So this isn't the actual viscosity number, but this is the number that we measured in our viscosity test. So it's the time in seconds. And it's used to calculate the viscosity. So you have uh, 1.3, 7, 8.1, 6.8, 7. Now, what that means is that the longer it takes, the thicker it is. And if you notice, as you bump over to the hot temperature, AMSOIL, Supertech, and Pennzoil converged, meaning they got to be about the same number. But Mobile One, it, it still got thinner, but it stayed higher than the others. And then if you take that number and jump all the way over to the engine failure torture test times, you notice that Mobile One had the greatest viscosity in room hot. It lasted the longest. The uh, Supertech of the oils had the lowest viscosity at room temperature, still had the lowest at hot, though it was closer. It didn't last very long. Um, Amsoil and Pennzoil had the same at room temperature the same hot and they lasted within 25 seconds of each other. So if you look, the, the, the viscosity numbers seem to correlate with the engine failure times. So let's move over all the way to the gear, gear transfer and oil retention. Same deal. We see that Mobile One retained more across all categories. And then Penn's oil in the hot retained very close to the AMS oil both times, new and used. And Supertech retained the very least and it lasted the shortest time. So your gear transfer retention, your viscosity, correlate with the engine failure. So both of those both of those categories together is what is going to determine your outcome. In this particular torture test. So the thicker the oil, the potential that it lasts longer, and the gear transfer the oil retention, meaning that more of the oil is sticking there. So you've got more oil mm -hmm. that's thicker. Correct. So better gear, better oil retention, better viscosity or, or thicker viscosity. Thicker viscosity. Would then correlate to the... To the survival in this torture test. Right. Now we've got to make sure that we clarify that just because the oil is more viscous doesn't mean it's the best oil for your motor. It means that if you are running a more viscous oil, your order, or if you have a catastrophic failure in your oil system, your engine will last longer before it completely destroys itself. Again, is this applicable to real world? Yeah, if you hit a rock on the freeway and blow a hole in your oil pan and don't realize you've done so, this means that when your oil light comes on, you're going to have more time to get off the road before you've permanently ruined your engine. So if we were to take these numbers to a full-size engine, would they be exponentially different than each other? I can't give you a definitive mathematical ratio without testing, empirical testing. We'd have to go out and try it. You have a greater bearing surface. You have oil being placed there under pressure. You have a finer control because these engines, these, these little cheap engines that we're using, they're, they've got tight tolerances, but they're not nearly as precision machined as a full-size engine is. So 
you run a you run a car engine completely out of oil. There is more oil in place, and there's better surfaces for it to run on. But it's also running at a lot fi- higher RPM, a lot higher horsepower. There's too many variables to say that. Oh yeah, if it lasted seven seconds versus five seconds, you go to a real engine, it'll last thirty five seconds longer versus. You know, you can't make a direct comparison. You'd have to test because every engine is different. What we are saying is that once that check engine, that check oil light comes on, the oil pressure light comes on, I can say for certain that Mobile One in this in this situation would survive longer than your super tech, guaranteed. It would survive longer. How much longer and how much longer that did it, would it survive than these little one cylinders? I don't know. And it might not be long enough to matter. It might not be long Let's enough Let's just to say matter. that these numbers do translate exactly over to a full-size engine. If you're trying to tell me that in 7 minutes and 42 seconds you can get off of whatever highway or road you're and on shut and the shut the engine off versus, in, versus one that's only going to last 5 minutes and 54 seconds, that 2 minutes difference between the two is just not enough for you to react. And by the time you're getting up to that time frame, you've, you've probably are, ruined things. Even though your engine's still, still running, running, you've probably damaged the brakes because... When we did this control with the air, you predicted, you were, you, were, you were listening to it and you reached down. And I don't know if you guys could hear this on the audio because the engines are pretty loud. But you see him reach down and he touches the motor. He said to me, this thing's getting ready to quit. And it quit within about 15 seconds of him saying that. Because we could hear the damage starting to happen before it actually stopped running. And that's the thing is that you could, we could go back and review the video, but... I bet that if we watched all these again with that in mind, we could hear when the damage started happening and then how long it ran after that. Once that reaches that point of damage, the friction builds up, the oil gets vaporized, and then it's just metal on metal. So so it wouldn't matter if you were able to shut your car off and try to save it. If you'd already reached that point. Yeah, done. at a certain point, you're just it's, it's but, completely done. So but now that I've said that, let's think about this for a moment. What we're saying here is that our air control... It lasted for 1 minute and 13 seconds. So that one we know was getting damaged from the moment we started it because there was no oil in there. It was metal on metal. So maybe what we could, this is, again, not a scientific mathematical assertion, but it's an approximation that we could say the damage, the time it takes from when the damage starts to the engine stops is 1 minute and 13 seconds. So we could technically say that if we might minus that 1 minute and 13 seconds from all these oils, that gives you your approximate time that it's protected before it starts taking damage. If you take our worst performer, SuperTech, at 5.52, you minus 113, you get 3 minutes and 39 seconds. So theoretically, approximately 3 minutes and 39 seconds, there was no damage being done. And then at that time, it started taking damage, and 1 minute 13 seconds later, it quit. So if you, if you compare that, that gives you an approximate time that you might be able to make it without permanent damage. This might be something that we could play with in the future because when I start getting through, and I've told everybody before, I don't know how many of these of these other oils. I might do some conventional oils and stuff like that, but I'm not going to do every single high mileage and every single mm-hmm. weight. There's just so many oils. I'd be doing this for I'd be doing this for years and years and years and years. And as fun as this has been, I don't. Uh, it, it is kind of a pain to do this kind of stuff. I don't want to continue to do every single oil, but I wanted to continue to do every single brand name of their highest uh, SN number, their SN number and their API ratings. I want to, I want to do kind of their high performance oils, but it would be interesting to take one of these ones that we've already tested and run it and take this one minute and 13 second time frame within a reasonable amount, maybe 10% give or take, and, and run an AMS oil or whatever oil it is and subtract that time from it and run it and then I stop, stop the, the engine. engine and see what the insides look like. If they aren't damaged at that time, it shows that that's about the time that oil would burn off. And that's if you can replicate these tests exactly. And I think mm-hmm. based on these results that we have been receiving, I, I firmly believe that this could be replicated within 10%. Mm-hmm. And again, we're talking about very small amounts of time. 10%, if I gave you 10% longer to, to run your car and it was five minutes and 50 seconds, mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's nothing. And so when you're driving down the highway at highway speed, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour, between the wind and the road noise, 
it would mask and hide these clicking and these in these grinding sounds that your engines would make. You got a little bit of music on. Mm -hmm. You might not even hear it at 30, 40 miles an hour if you've got just a little bit of music going. And especially with some of these BMWs and some of these other uh, luxury cars, you got some more sound deadening. You just you don't hear it. Five minutes is not long enough. And I hope that they would last longer in a full size engine. And there's been other testing that can get these engines like. Mm. I don't know how much some of these other ones were doing, but they were claiming some ridiculous amount of mileage. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't test it on any of my vehicles. Mm -mm. I don't care how good the oil is. Uh, I, I, I would not be willing to put my engine in the line of fire to test something like that. And that's why we're doing this in a small engine format. Mm -hmm. So then if you look at the surface tension, they, they don't really correlate because surface tension is not related to the, the retention on on a surface it's, it's funny surface tension does not relate to how it retains on a surface surface tension is only applicable in capillary action and floating things on the surface before you get into the buoyancy factor surface tension is a is a different animal entirely surface tension is really interesting because capillary action is based off of surface tension and so if you take a tiny tiny tube and stick it into water here's the surface level of the water it's it climbs it now this surface tension test that you did uh-huh is very it's a test of mass surface tension, but it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't test its capillary action. The way they measure the actual surface tension number is the angle between the flat part of the thing and where it's clinging to the wall on the capillary. Surface tension varies greatly with contamination. So room temperature, room temperature. Some of them went down, some of them went up, some went way up, some of them barely changed. So you're saying that the that the surface tension could be changing based on how dirty the oil got mm -hmm. and potentially how much or how little assembly lube and stuff was already in the engine to begin with that would have diluted mm -hmm. the oil. Yeah, surface tension is very sensitive to contaminants. And by contaminants, it could be additives. So in, a, in an engine, the only time surface tension is going to come into play is going to be in a non-pressurized tiny space. What that the only time this is going to make a difference is let's say you've turned off your engine, it's been sitting for days. If the surface tension is the correct number combined with viscosity, and, and this is the part that's really interesting, there's a there is no direct mathematical correlation to viscosity and surface tension, but once you get into confined spaces, they actually do kind of affect each other. They don't actually affect how far it'll climb, but they do affect how fast it will climb. Water has a very low viscosity and has a very high surface tension. So water will climb a capillary tube, so a tiny tube, it will climb it just like that. It'll just whoop, shoot right up. You make the tube even tinier, and it'll go a lot further. Oil, it's got a it's got a much thicker viscosity, but some of the surface tensions are very similar, especially when dirty, to, to each other, but they're not nearly as high as water, so they won't climb as high, and they climb slowly. So if you let your motor sit for a long period of time, you're gonna have some oil in that tiny space between your bearing and your crankshaft. And the tackiness, or the, the gear transfer retention says, once I get it there, it'll stay there. The surface tension says, if that gap is small, I'll also climb. So your, your, your stuff like your penetrating oils, like WD-40, they use capillary action and surface tension to penetrate far into something. But they're also called dry lubricants mm -hmm. because they don't stay there. They, they eventually roll off. But they will penetrate the tiny surfaces and enter them because their surface tensions are the correct number. So as cool as it is to know the surface tension, and again, I, these aren't mm -hmm. obviously ours aren't scientific testing. I don't have some big laboratory or fancy way to measure something super super small as as fun as it is to get this number here it's relatively unimportant compared to the viscosity and oil retention mm -hmm. and it plays a very small role in the actual engine failure times uh, yeah in this type of testing now if you get into the hydraulics like transmission fluid it matters a lot because those are tiny passages and there's other stuff going on in transmissions transmissions are a hydrodynamic monster when it comes to the mathematics. Fluid dynamics is a deep field and really, really diving into fluid dynamics takes a lot of time. I mean, the basics of fluid dynamics they teach is a 400 level course in college. And then there's entire master's degrees on one section of fluid dynamics. So the guys that are making oils, they know this stuff in and out and backwards and they're not telling anybody how to do it. That's why you have competing oil companies that are arguing about you know, mine's better, mine's not. They're going for different things. So our test is saying that if you, you lose your oil pressure and your engine runs out of oil, so far you want to have be, we want to be running mobile one. 
but it's all up to you. So I'm going to say something that uh, is probably not very popular is uh, it really doesn't matter which oil you get as long as you make sure to get the weight and the recommended API SN rating from your manufacturer. I really think a lot of this, the majority of this, is based on personal preference, uh, brand name, uh, loyalty, which is totally fine, and I totally understand that. Honestly, based on my list, I still truly believe that, but based on my list, even though I believe that fully, that most of it's personal preference, I would not put Super Tech in my car. <laughs> I'm not gonna put Super Tech in my car either. <laughs> so it's funny that I res- I'm res- and I'm respecting my my outcome, but at the same time, I know a lot of it's just built up hype and you know mm-hmm. competitiveness, which is again, it's it's totally normal in a competition and stuff like that. But based on my list, I would not put Super Tech in my car. <laughs> Agreed. So, and and I've said this a couple of times. I am actually respecting the um, results of this. Every single time I post a video, I've get, I'm getting another brand. brand yeah. And every two brands I get is another uh, two or three videos, depending on how we test them. So I am going to be respecting this. This summer, I am going to be running Royal Purple again. Uh, it worked really well for me last year, and I'm going to continue to use what I know works, but I... I'm going to hold myself to it, and whatever's the outcome of this, I will get the highest SN API rating of whatever brand it was and get my oil weight, and that's what I that's what I will put in my race car. So I hope that answered uh, everybody's questions and helped clear some of this up. There was a lot of confusion, and, and I totally understand because I was confused, and I would call David up, and we would talk for so long about fluid dynamics and, and trying to understand what was going on here. And it was really cool to get this control test. Uh, I really appreciate David coming all the way up here, helping us out with some videos and explaining some of this stuff with us. We were actually gonna do this video over the phone and I'm glad we were able to have him here so that we could get some good audio between the two of us and get some good dialogue. So if you have any other questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. We'll try our best to answer them. If it's something super complicated, I guess we'll just make another video. So if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. If you're new, subscribe. We've got plenty of oil videos coming up. We've got plenty of E36 videos coming up. We've got plenty of E46 videos. So stay tuned for all that and we will see you in the next video.